Hi everyone and welcome to this VIPS lecture on chironomids. My name is Stefan, I'm a lecturer at Birkbeck University of London where I teach modules on environmental science and physical geography. In my spare time I guess I'm also a visiting lecturer at Royal Holloway University of London where I provide a specialized module on chironomids for the masters in quaternary science. And that's also going to be the topic of today. So I'll be talking about chironomids and specifically about their application as a paleo temperature proxy. Now, I will only mainly focus on Europe or Northwest Europe in the remainder of this talk. But before we move on, I just wanted to say that this approach is not exclusive to this area of the world. It's actually been applied in numerous regions, including North and South America, Russia, New Zealand, etc. Uh, but because I work in Europe myself and a lot of my co-workers do. That's what we'll be focusing on in the next 10-15 minutes or so. Now, why do we want to apply chironomids within any paleoecological project and specifically in projects aimed to uh, provide quantitative records of past climate change? Well, to go back uh, a little bit before people ask that question, I guess when we look at uh, paleoecology in general, it's always been a field that has provided lots of qualitative inferences of the past environment. So even the earliest pollen records and um, related paleoecological records would have statements in them saying this particular interval, let's say the Younger Dryas was cold or this particular interval, let's say the early Holocene was dry. So those qualitative climate reconstructions and other types of uh, environmental reconstructions have always been part of the paleoecological approach. However, as time has progressed, we've increasingly seen a need for quantitative records. So rather than saying it was cold, we uh, were asked to say, well, how cold was it? Was it 10 degrees, 12 degrees? What was the temperature difference going from point A in time to point B in time? And there, had not, there were a number of reasons for uh, such questions to be answered. And specifically, when providing quantitative records, you turn your complicated um, paleoecological record, which typically holds dozens of wiggly lines, into a single line that's much more easy to interpret for the non-expert. So archaeologists could all of a sudden start to really use our paleoenvironmental data. Similarly, climate modelers could use our paleo temperature reconstructions as direct input into their models for, for instance, model verification. And we now are even seeing that influential reports like the IPCC reports are taken into account our quantitative reconstruction. So there is a need and a demand for these quantitative records. And initially these were, I guess, mostly derived from pollen and beetles. But since the 1990s, we've seen increasing research focus on the use of chironomids as a paleo temperature proxy. So what is a chironomid? Well, basically, I hope you can agree with me if you look at this picture that's on the screen here, that a chironomid is a an insect. It's actually a bi-winged fly and a common name would be a non-biting midge. Uh, and it's a family within the order of the diptera, the bi-winged uh, insects. And as all dipterans, chironomids are so-called holometabulous insects, meaning they have four individual life stages. So they start their life cycle as an egg. They then move on to be a larva. larva. The larval stage itself actually has four different stages, sub-stages, if you will, that we call instars. Uh, they then turn to pupae and finally into adults, which are in entomological terms are called imagos. So four different stages to a chironomid life cycle. And why is this important? Well, for a number of reasons. But first, let's let's focus on the larval stage, which during which time a chironomid larva basically looks a bit like a wiggly worm, if you will. And in the top right, you see a picture of, of a living larva and on the right hand side uh, in a little bit that's encircled you see its head and the head of a chronomid larva is made of a weathering resistant material called chitin chitin preserves really well in lake sediments and in other wet environments and on top of that the head capsule itself has all kinds of morphological uh, characteristics that we can use to identify a fossil or even a living head capsule uh, often to genus type, but even quite often beyond that to morphotype or sometimes even species type. So we can use fossilized bits of these coronamid larvae as encountered in lake sediments to reconstruct what the past coronamid fauna of a lake must have been like. 
Now that's where we get to the use of coronamids as a proxy. And first off, let me very quickly say a few words on why we specifically go for temperature as a sort of um, uh, an aim, a research aim to reconstruct that. And that is because temperature is a main influence on um, the development of coronamids during its individual life stages, specifically so during the larval life stage. And, and temperature is also a driving factor, driving transitions between different life stages. So for instance, uh, pupation, so the transition from a larva to a pupa, is very strongly driven by factors like light intensity and temperature. So as a result of that, the development of chironomids and uh, with, with differences between individual species is very strongly related to temperature. So we can use them as an indicator for temperature. We actually can see when we do large scale observations that a lot of our coronamid species are stenothermic, meaning they have a very narrow temperature envelope within which they want to occur. But coronamids have other advantages um, when it comes to using them as a proxy. So first of all, you can find them anywhere. Anywhere you have fresh water, you find coronamids and you just you don't just find one or two, but you find dozens or hundreds or hundreds of thousands of them sometimes in the very sort of coronamid rich habitats. As we briefly just discussed, um, coronamids are identifiable within the fossil record to species level or at least to morphotype level. And coronamids are species rich. So I currently live in the UK. And if you would sample a lake here in the surroundings, you'd probably find around about 50 species or so uh, for each individual lake. So very species rich relative to some other indicator groups. Uh, we also mentioned that they are stenothermic, so having a very narrow temperature optima. And finally, coronamids live in the lake itself from which you take your sediment core. So in that sense, uh, there basically isn't some of the problems that exist for other proxies having to do with transport of your proxy of interest to the lake don't exist for coronamids because they actually developed within this particular habitat. So what do you do when you want to make a coronamid inferred temperature record? How do you go about um, um, reaching that? Well, the first step is to actually describe the relationship between coronamids and their physical environment. And this is done using so-called um, coronamid climate calibration data sets. And the way such a data set is produced, and typically this has already been done by other researchers in the field, um, is that a suite of lakes is sampled across a temperature gradient in this instance. So here you see a picture of well, what used to be two individual data sets that have now been merged, where researchers took uh, lakes or lake sediment samples from southern Norway all the way to northern, northern Norway and even into Spitsbergen, or they did this in in Switzerland where they sampled lakes from the lowlands all the way to uh, high alpine lakes, uh, that way basically having an altitudinal temperature gradient. So for each of the lakes, they took a sediment sample from the center of the lake, they analyzed which coronamids occurred there in, and in what relative abundances, they gathered environmental data, uh, including um, temperature data, and then modeled the relationship between the two. So in a mathematical, uh, I guess, visualization, you would have two data sets, two spreadsheets, simply in Excel um, or in R, if you will, where on the left hand side, you see a table where you have coronamid one, two, three, four uh, on each row. You have individual lakes where you did measurements. And for each of these cells, you have a measurement in percentages. On the right hand side, you then have another table, which is the environmental data, uh, which has the same lakes. So one, two, three, four, up to hundreds of lakes nowadays and environmental data, for instance, in the on the first row, including temperature. So this would be your calibration data set or also sometimes colloquially called training set and describing the relationship between one and the other is a set of, multi, uh, of uh, multivariate um, mathematical equations, which are basically your transfer function. So this is your first step. You want to have that description of how each coronamid responds to temperature. Your next step then would be to sample a down record. So you go to your lake of interest where you want to know something about the past environment. In this case, again, specifically interested in uh, temperature development. You would identify your individual coronamid species 
And here you see an example of um, a data set from a Dutch lake called Heikermeer, which I personally was involved with as well. Um, on the y-axis, you have relative sediment depth, in this case, spanning a one meter sediment interval across the lake glacial, and you have different individual coronamid texts. In this case, grouped according to their modern day preferences. We have coronamids on the left-hand side of the diagram, typically occurring in lowlands environments in Switzerland, and all those coronamid texts on the right-hand side of the diagram, typically occurring in very alpine or cold conditions. And you can see on and offs between these uh, individual coronamid or groups of coronamids uh, throughout this diagram. Now the final step then is to sort of complete this particular um, mathematical approach. So the top hand part of this um, slide we've already covered where we have our calibration data set and the training uh, the transfer function mathematically describing how each coronamid responds to temperature. Now what we have in terms of our fossil data is another table here on the bottom left where we have the same coronamid taxa. We can apply our transfer function to the same coronamid taxa and that will then ultimately give us a um, temperature estimate for each of our individual depths. So that is in a nutshell how we try to reconstruct temperatures using um, what's, well, typically I would say that the weighting averaging partially squares um, methodology. How does that look sort of in reality? Well, something like this. So on the right hand side, you now have a figure which compares on the top a chronometer inferred July at temperature record to the Greenland ice core record, which is on the, uh, shown on the bottom on a, in this case, ice core year timescale. Um, so that top record, that uh, slightly thinner blue line, is one wiggly line that's derived from all those individual coronamid taxa and is basically showing you quantitative uh, temperature estimates. So you can see on the left hand side there a y axis of between 13 to 17 degrees July at temperature. What you can furthermore see in this case is the high correspondence between uh, July at temperature changes within the Netherlands where this lake was from and um, well, let's say this, this temperature proxy from the Greenland ice cores. So that was initially a very convincing result. There's more behind this. So if you really want to sort of publish these kinds of data, you would also have to have some reliability tests showing the robustness of your reconstruction. You'd have to provide ecological information on the text that you have, etc. But in a nutshell, that's how you basically start from scratch, build a transfer function, um, build a down core record, apply that transfer function and then get a temperature record such as shown on this slide. Now there are certain challenges involved in this approach and I guess that mainly stems from the fact that this approach will always produce a wiggly line but it doesn't necessarily always produce a wiggly line that's robust, reliable or even realistic. And questions you always need to ask are things like was temperature really the driver of the makeup of my coronamid fauna? with time and if you do additional statistical tests do they flag up any problems um, do your quantitative records actually make uh, results make sense when you compare them to other data or even just the, the numbers are they uh, realistic or remotely possible to get those so those are the kind of questions you have to critically answer ask yourself um, even after you've completed your first set of tests so by now, there's been lots of applications of this methodology to late glacial sites. I've already shown you one example uh, from Lake Heikermeer in the Netherlands, but there's many more that exist now. Um, what you see here in this particular um, slide is the, I would say, um, almost the, the very first uh, convincing application where the top panel shows you temperature evolution for Withrig Bog in uh, Scotland, in the UK, again, compared to the Greenland ice core records and showing a very high um, similarity. And by now, there's dozens and dozens of late glacial sites available, and there's two good overview papers one by Steve Brooks and Pete Langdon in 2014, and another one by uh, Oliver Hyrie, also in the same year, and co workers. And I'm not going to go into too much detail, but you can now actually start to really look into each individual time slice of this transitional period from the last glacial into the current interglacial and really look at temperature gradients, for instance, on the north-south um, transect across Europe and really see whether or not 
climate patterns were similar in the past as they are today. And in a nutshell, well, actually, probably they weren't. Um, so really, if you're interested in that, have a look at um, the Hyrie et al. paper for more detail. Where else is the field going? Well, we have other applications as well. Increasingly, we've seen more applications of this methodology to Holocene records. So I'm showing you just one example here of uh, a record from Sweden where we have inferred temperatures from the onset of the Holocene to the present, showing a very slight decreasing trend. I'm not sure if you can see my pointer, but it's here in the central part of the figure with these uh, error estimates. So a slight decreasing trend and a slight sort of jump in towards slightly cooler temperatures around the onset of what we call the neoglacial. So this is just one example that I've uh, personally published not too long ago. In a fairly recent um, data amalgamation exercise led by Daryl Kaufman and co-authors, of which I was also a part, we've actually been able to include 83 individual quantitative chronometer records there. Um, cover a significant part of the Holocene, just showing you how many records are actually already available there. And the data plot on the top right here, that red line, actually shows you the sort of average inferred value, in this case standardized, but showing that on average across the whole globe, coronamids show steeply increasing temperatures at the end of the last glacial into the Holocene, and then across most of the Holocene, a decreasing trend towards slightly cooler temperatures up to the, well, let's say, a few centuries ago. Um, so lots of data out there. There are further applications on glacial interglacial timescale, so preceding the glacial interglacial transition, something I've worked on myself personally as well. And I guess by now, I mean, there have been critiques and rightly so, but chronometers are typically seen as a reliable temperature indicator and as an essential component of any paleoecological project focusing on lake sediment records. The main application is for temperature reconstructions, although you can infer all kinds of other things from chronometers as well, especially in a qualitative sense. Um, but I would sort of say that it is always important to keep a critical attitude uh, simply because as I've um, referred to before the method will always give you results but you do have to make a case on whether or not these results are actually reliable now what's going to happen in the near future well we're probably going to see increasing applications of this method within as well as outside of europe increasingly so probably also on very short time scales so sub recent time scales as well as time scales preceding the late glacial interglacial transition and we see very exciting novel approaches um Taking, taking hold, for instance, focusing more on estimates of past diversity rather than past temperature. Um, so I think that's all very exciting to see. So lots of new things being done um, on a day-to-day -day basis, almost, I would say. If you want to read up more, then here are some, I think, good starting papers and chapters and books uh, that you can sort of use to sort of get some basic insight into chronometric ecology and to the first applications of temperature proxies and also just sort of more general background. If you have any questions after watching this um, video, don't hesitate to reach out for me, uh, for instance, for email or Twitter. So thank you very much.